Hello, my name is Sergio Monsalve. I'm a founding partner at Roble Ventures, and I'm also a lecturer at Stanford University. I think the future of education and education technology is incredibly bright. If we're able to do one thing, ChatGPT came out. It has attracted more than a million users. ChatGPT impressed the University of Minnesota Law School C plus average on its final exam. Is education going to be like if people don't need to write for their jobs? Today, New York City School District announced that prohibit the use of ChatGPT to any student, which is impossible because they can use it anywhere. But at the end of the day, this is exactly what I'm talking about is how do we elevate education to focus on the things that human are equipped to do. You know, what happened with the calculator and the word processors, spelling and arithmetic became less of an issue and less of a thing you focus on. Of course, you need to know how to do them. But at the end of the day, you probably will not ask a prompt that is very basic, what the chat GPT can actually answer. You probably will have to go deeper and use a lot more of your humanism to answer those things and get credit for your assignment. So I could see education moving in a way where we elevate humans to be much more abstract using more of their human skills, empathy, courage, things like that. The changes are inevitable. I just don't think you can just fight it. You have to elevate the student. We're no longer a luxurious place where we could actually take a job for the next 20 years, inch our way up into the ladder and retire and that's it. You're going to have multiple careers. There's going to be multiple reductions of force, increases of force. There's going to be a lot of things that are happening a lot faster. You have to be adaptable to those changes. This is why you need to focus on human capabilities faster and more iteratively than we did before. This is why we cannot afford having people just go to school from five years old to 25 years old. They have to be going to school for life. This is why I love education, is if we can re-architect some of the ways we teach, focus much more on that future, then I think we have a very bright future. So my personal story is I was born and raised in Mexico City and came when I was 13, not knowing any English at all. Uh, education for me became not a nice to have, but a must have. That stuck with me. And so I ended up here at Stanford where I studied industrial engineering. I've had to muster a lot of resilience. Later in my years at Stanford, I really got enamored with mergers and acquisitions and sort of the financing side of, of engineering and, and business. So I ended up working at Wall Street for two years at Morgan Stanley, where I did a lot of M&A as an analyst. And later on, I actually became a venture capital investor. One of the things that I really focused on is just to do the things that I really wanted to do that I was really curious about. One of my really close friends was from Finland. Growing up in a time where we still had this thing called the Soviet Union, to me, it was very interesting to have very deep discussions with him about the value of capitalism versus what other systems had. And he had obviously been a neighbor to the biggest non-capitalist society. So I became very intrigued about what capitalism can do for people and also the threats of capitalism if it goes awry, meaning in socioeconomic inequities. And so to me, that was the beginning of why I'm doing Roble, frankly, because I understand that capitalism is not perfect and we need to kind of approach capitalism with a purpose. Where I became pretty interested in education Education and a lot of investors at the time had said education's like the worst place to invest because that's how everybody's lost their money. And the way they were thinking about it, I would say, okay, I agree because K through 12 and higher ed had an incumbent that was unmovable, right? Which is the government, basically. But what people don't realize, and I started really thinking about it, we learn formally from four or five years old, kindergarten, all the way to 18 if you finish high school, 21 if you finish college, that's it. Then what do you do from 25 to 100? You're not formally learning. You're actually working, most likely not going to be formally trained by your employer. And that was okay when the industry innovation was moving very slowly. But in today's economy, things are moving exponentially fast. And in that world, you have to have human capabilities be catching up much faster and you have to upload information knowledge and skills to humans much faster so i thought we needed to have this new industry called adult learning
we started looking a lot in different companies and the one that really caught my attention was Udemy. I really thought that they had a way to create very quality content at a very affordable price. The supply side of the marketplace was very thriving and very happy. They're making a good income for themselves. So you're enabling humans to make more money as teachers on Udemy than outside. And on the flip side, you're actually making courses that are very affordable for anybody in the world, right? So to me, that was a perfect model. And so I invested in it and it happens that after six and a half, seven years of being on that board, we ended up taking it public and it was a very fruitful investment for us. To me, capitalism without purpose is not necessarily the way I want to live my life. And there's many ways. And I learned it, frankly, one of my biggest teachers was being on the board of Udemy and understanding that business. It allowed me to think about one profession that should be revered as heroes in society, teachers, they don't get paid or viewed as heroes in this society because they're not viewed as in the center of capitalism. It's like odd. We are such a rich country, yet our most important contributors to society are not being valued that way. So to me, that's an aberration of the system that we've created. So there's a way to build it, and that is through technology. And Udemy showed me that, right? Some of the instructors in Udemy are making over a million dollars a year. So that's great. That's human enablement. So that to me is what made me really enriching when you see the faces of people that you've actually helped because of the funding that you've given and the founder and what the entrepreneur has been able to build and grow. And so you were a little part of it. Think about how big K through 12 and higher ed is in terms of market size. You're talking about trillions. So there's probably a few industries that are bigger, but not many. Maybe financial services, maybe energy, the governments, but that's it. Education is just comes right behind. It's probably one of the top five, if not the top three industries in the world. And that's only counting K through 12 through higher ed. I think the future of education and education technology is incredibly bright if we're able to do one thing, which is to really teach how to be better individuals, more emotionally aware, more have soft skills are gonna enable us to essentially collaborate with the prowess of computing rather than compete with it or try to topple it. At Roble, we have a playbook on how to assess companies. In fact, one of the things, the reason I started this class at Stanford on entrepreneurship and education technology is because of what I saw in the world of investments and the mistakes were being made both by the founding teams but also by the venture investors. In education, you need to bring the educators and the entrepreneurs, engineers together so that the learning science, as well as the technology, as well as the business, all work work together. So it's a very inclusive way to build a company. In education, it didn't work that way because a lot of people thought they knew education because they had been educated themselves. So I started the class with the thesis around how to properly diligence these companies. Most important thing to net it out on what we look for, it goes back to people. And this is why I also we call it human enablement. The theme itself is also about how we enable our own entrepreneurs. Team and market are probably the most important things. The reality is a lot of the companies pivot. So it's not about the product, it's about what it says about the team and about the market. The commonality in all the greatest companies, the ones that have succeeded the most, it comes back to a great set of people that work well together. So this this is why I focus on their roadmap for a team, but also as importantly, how are they gonna build their investor base and their board composition? You need to be bringing a diverse set of people from the beginning onto those boards and creating a real independent and diverse group of people. So that has to happen both in the board level and the executive level and the, at the CEO level. And so I think it's about people. And that's why I spent a lot of time thinking about this human enablement theme because it has a very much a people component in the name itself, both as what we invest in, but also how we work with our companies.